Good morning, everybody, and thank you for coming to this session. Um, quite a big crowd. I'm really happy to see that. Um, before I get started, I thought I'd give you a recount a quick story from my past, which is relevant to today's talk, and it has a happy ending. Um, it starts way back when I actually was coding for a living. I wrote code in C, and most of this code was uh, installed in these big metal containers that was installed by the telephone companies on the side of the street anywhere across the US. What it did was, when you picked up your landline phone, not just cell phone, it gave you dial tone and connected you to the, postal, to the public uh, telephone network. Occasionally, like all code, my code had bugs, and uh, if, if I was lucky, most of these bugs were caught in the QA time process. If I was unlucky, I would get on a plane and go to someplace warm like Toronto in midwinter to fix the problem uh, and face a very irate customer. But the process I used was always the same. I would recompile my code, put a bunch of print statements in, cross my fingers, and pray that one, the pr problem would be reproduced, and two, my print was in the right place. So any endeavor based on prayer doesn't always work the first time. So you would keep trying this out till you got the problem. Now the telecommunication software vendors became wise and they adopted standards. And two particular standards that helped us developers. One, they adopted real-time uh, off-the-shelf operating systems, and then they adopted debuggers. This was my hallelujah moment, if you will. I could now attach a debugger to a running code, either in the lab or in the field, set watch points, figure out what's going on, no prints. 2018, you would expect nobody should be using print statements. Considering the size of this room, I'm thinking quite a few are still using print statements. And uh, I think, I'm hoping that at the end of this talk, you will have your own little hallelujah moment because of the tool that we're gonna talk about. Well, enough of my background. Let's just talk a little bit of how I'm going to talk, break today's talk. I'm gonna introduce Pepadata just briefly. Um, I'm gonna make it relevant to this audience and talk about the application performance management that we provide for Spark developers. I'll dive into the problem at hand. I'm, of course, trying to be pithy here by saying laziness makes the debugging hard. It's essentially, the problem is Spark does lazy evaluation of the code, and that tends to smoosh together all the intermediate information and that's the reason why it's hard to debug the problems when they happen. I'm gonna introduce a solution that Pepadata has been working on. Uh, this is not something that we've just done on our own. This comes from an original paper done in AmpLab by Ankur, Dave, and uh, Mate, and there's also some work done by the UCLA folks. So this is just kind of making it a little more commercial, if you will. I'm gonna close out with a demo. Uh, I'm not gonna attempt the demo gods, I've got a video, um, but I promise you it's not cooked up, it's real. Uh, I'm gonna close out with Q&A. So just a quick introduction to Pepper Data. We, are, we do performance management for big data, whether, it's the, whether you're the operator or the developer. We have tools, we have solutions that help make your life easier, better. I'm gonna talk mostly about our APM for Spark. We also do Hadoop. So this is, a, our application summary view, if you will. This is a Spark application. We kind of talk about, hey, your application can run better, and we give you specific recommendations that you can do. We also detect bottlenecks. If they run, your application is running, say, on a yarn cluster, and you're waiting uh, for a long time for your application to actually get scheduled, we can detect that and tell you up in, up in advance that, hey, you probably want to do something about this. Uh, we also, have, uh, we also give you a high-level overview of your resource consumption usage. In this case, this application is pretty uh, wasteful in its memory. It's asked for a lot, and it's using very little. So it kind of helps you be a better tenant of your cluster. For Spark, we actually give you a little more information. We give you information. Let's say this application had a pretty bad failure, set of failures. What we do is we collect all the failure information, we'll put it in chronological order so you can get to root cause. We will also give you drill downs that says, hey, in this particular case, I'm showing you a drill down of one particular executor in the entire uh, cycle. And this executor was killed by yarn because, as you can see, it, it blew its memory bounds 
and you know now why, what you can do in order to fix it. So high level, that's kind of, we, you, you can go to our booth and we can give you a detailed demo, but that's all I want to talk about our APM solution. So let's talk about why is debugging hard. So all of you know, RDDs are the kind of the fundamental data construct in Spark. Uh, and these, and the your RDD data is basically, it's, it's not computed or transformed or anything until an action takes place. I'm gonna, essentially what I'm saying is transformations are invisible to the developer. So this is taken straight out of uh, Apache Spark's documentation. RDDs support two operations, transformations, which is primarily you'll go to your, if you look at your Spark web UI, you see that most of the actions, you, most of the uh, operations are transformations triggered by an action. And so as transformations in Spark are lazy, they're only computed when an action requires the results to be returned to your driver. So what does that mean and how does it help? I'm gonna just visualize it in terms of showing you code on the left-hand side. I don't, I don't expect you to actually be able to read it, it's just illustration purposes. But it basically says, I have code on my left-hand side, how does it get translated into a stage? And as you can see, uh, each, this block of code over here gets translated into a whole bunch of RDDs, each transformation, and then it, the following two lines also get separated into their own RDDs. Now what if you as a developer suspect that the problem is with RDD 10? What is your choice? You're gonna have to break your code there and put, some, put another uh, print statement so that you can collect the information. Now what if that was the wrong place to put the print statement? You're back in my hell from a long time ago. You have to keep doing this till you get your prob problem fixed. So that kind of talks about how people are solving the problem today. Sprinkle your code with print statements, hopefully catch it, if not, rinse and repeat. So what's our solution? Um, we're gonna take that same print statement that you're doing, but we're gonna automate that process. We're gonna trigger an action so that you can inspect any RDD in the DAG. We started off by saying, let's just define some requirements for us because we want this to be a very user-friendly tool. So start off, we don't want you to do any changes to your code. You can run it with any code either in, either in your lab or in production. We want to work with any standard Spark distribution out there. We don't want to have a special Spark distribution. Finally, we want to provide you with a familiar interface, a debugger-like interface, so that you can interact with your code and inspect your data. So let's take a quick look at what it is we are doing. Nothing new here. You've seen this, this illustration countless other places. It basically says that on the left-hand side, I start with the user code. The driver then creates an RDD dependency graph. It then uh, creates a DAG of, of stages, and, and these stages have tasks that then get uh, executed by the workers. So nothing new here. Next one will tell you how we're kind of inserting ourselves in the process in order to help you uh, inspect your RDDs as they get transformed. We insert our code, which basically has two components to it. We, in, we kind of observe the RDDs as, as your application is progressing from start to finish. We collect all the RDD metadata, so we understand the basic structure of the RDD, and we provide a REST API. So once your application has finished running, we kind of stop it, we don't let it stop uh, and finish, we kind of hold it there, and then we provide a REST API that's available either through a UI or through a CLI. And now you can interact with your driver to basically say, hey, I'm interested in looking at one particular RDD. So in the previous slide, I talked about RDD 10. So essentially what will happen is we create a new job that says, I want to look just at our, so this was the original stage that we looked at earlier and we said in order to put, uh, if you want to examine RDD 10, I need to break the code, put a print statement in. Essentially what we do is we say, we're gonna give you in the CLI interface, we'll give you a, a, a command that you can do. In this case, it's just saying, I want to look at RDD 10, and it'll show you the ten, first 10 records of that RDD. So this is kind of how it looks like. I have a CLI on the left, it triggers an action which generates a new stage, 
I mean, a new job, and that job, the only thing it does is print that RDD. So far, so good. Let's take a look at a demo. Let me first uh, give you a little bit of background about what this demo is trying to do. It's a very trivial example, but it shows you what, we, what, what the power of uh, kind of doing the inspection is in, in order to uh, debug a problem. We took an open source data, data uh, open source data. This was, uh, CDC had done a survey of 500 cities across the US and had created a, what we had was a, a big, huge, long file that tabulated all the chronic diseases in the US in adult populations. Uh, by city. We said, we're going to take this information. We're only going to look at how the incidences, incidence of diabetes in the adult population, and we're going to change it from cities and states to regions. So the information will be how many diabetics in the West, the South, Northwest, Northeast, and the Midwest. What we expect is input is a CSV file of roughly four and a half million rows. Digest it, process it, output should be this, these in this, this uh, distribution of information. The West has roughly 3.5 million diabetics and so on and so forth. So we run this. I'm going to show this. This is a, uh, a video recording of the original, original uh, application. And what you see is, I'm, oops. This is what you see over here is that you had unknown show up. Now, now we did not expect this to. Uh, we did not expect this result, and we need to figure out what happened in the code. What? Why did this mapping fail? What? So either there's a problem in my code or there's a problem in the data of the inside my, uh, that I'm transforming. So before I show you the, uh, the actual video of the uh, debugging session, let me show you how the, we expect the code to get transformed inside uh, the application and what we expect in terms of uh, the different transformations as they progress through the application. I start off by uh, basically ingesting the CSV file. So roughly that's RDD5 will have the entire one line of CSV file, a whole bunch of these will be, uh, you can see them. You then, dive, you then filter by disease type diabetes and you map it based on state and the impacted population. And the RDD should look something like the table on the bottom left hand corner. This is then mapped to regions so essentially take Alabama, which will be in the south, Alaska in the west, so on and so forth. And I expect this, this mapping to take place, which I finally reduce to a set of uh, the four regions in the US. And the RDD numbers associated with each of these transformations would be 5, 11, 12, and 16. So I'm going to show you a demo based on this debugger UI, so it makes sense to just take a moment and kind of look at this UI and see the different elements in here. So we have a, basically you set your Spark Web UI URL in there so we know which application to go talk to. On the left hand side is your code that you're running. Each of these blue lines represents a place that we have uh, identified that transformations take place. So you can set a, a breakpoint or uh, an inspection point, actually. My colleague back there who's actually done the coding would uh, told me to put, change this from breakpoint to inspection point because it's not really a breakpoint. Uh, and so you can set an inspection point on any of these blue lines. And once you set an inspection point on the right-hand side, we show you all the RDDs in that, uh, in, that belong to that line of code, if you will. And you can then set a filter. So as, as I said, we already look at the metadata of your uh, RDD. So things that are simple, like integers, strings, we can, uh, you can set those values. 
uh, as an RDD filter. If your data, if your, uh, data structure is complex, you can set your own, uh, you can set your own uh, Scala code in here, and we will take it and run, run the filter. So basically, once you run it, the output is the first 10 records that match that filter. So let's take a look at this in action. I'm going to be trying to do. So let's just get started here. Oops, I'm sorry, you're not seeing anything. Okay, so this is the first, pardon my fumbling over here, but essentially what you're seeing over here is, you, this is, I've set a breakpoint on, on, uh, on the line that corresponds to all the, uh, RDD5, and you can see that it it's basically has these, all the lines of CSV file, of the CSV file that has been ingested. And then you can go further and look at the next RDD, which was RDD11, and look at its contents. And you can see that it, does, it has all the states and the impacted populations in that state. Going further, we can then see the next map action. You can see that we have now mapped it to the different regions. And finally, we're gonna reduce it. And you can now see that it has mapped it and we now have the problem that we'd seen earlier that uh, a set of uh, records were not able to be mapped to the appropriate region and we need to find out why. So to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna go back a step to the previous line of code, and I'm going to set a filter, and I'm setting the filter to unknown type. So I wanna look at only RDDs that have unknown type in them, and I'm going to see if I can find a, a unique number. Basically, I don't want to have multiple uh, records, I wanna to get to one unique record so that I can then go one step back and see which state did that belong to. So in this case, this is of course, you didn't see my trial and error, I tried different and I know that 48301 is a unique, number, unique uh, record. So I've copied and pasted that. And now I can confirm that that was the only record of, uh, with population type 48301. So now what I need to do is go back a, another step and just see which state does that record belong to. Which state was, has that unique population count. So I'm gonna go one step further, leave the filter in place, run my code again, and now you can see that it says the state that I could not map was Georgia. So what's the problem with Georgia? Let's go and look at our map definition. Uh, oh good, I was thinking this would. So as you can see, the map has all the four regions defined, north, south, uh, mid, midwest, and I and Georgia belongs in the south. So let's look at the map of south and then you can see the problem so we had misspelled the word Georgia, so all records associated with Georgia were not being mapped or, or put in the right region. So essentially, without any, without any um, printfs, I was able to now take, just to recap, what did you see so far? You're able to set breakpoints or inspection points in your code, you're able to Look, inspect the data that's before or after the transformation. You can also set filters. We're working with, this was Spark 2.1. Uh, we're working with any distribution of Spark. And we've set it so that it's a familiar debugger-like interface so that you can now uh, interact with your code, whether it's in production or whether it's in, uh, it's in uh, your lab. 
give you a quick preview of what's coming up next for us. Our areas of focus going forward is, of course, we're going to do a whole bunch to improve the user experience and the UI. As you saw, this was a fairly rudimentary um, UI. We want to make it a lot more interactive and a lot more easy to use. We also want to change this. Right now, you have, to re you have to run your job again if you want to debug it. We'd like to be, enable you to attach to a running job. So that, let's say you have a streaming use case, you're able to do that. We also want to make it so that you can run a job. Let's say it's a very long running job and you have a problem that happens only occasionally. How do you pause a job just on hitting that condition? Spark SQL is another area of interest for us. Spark SQL is where you have a SQL statement. A whole bunch of magic happens within uh, the Spark execution engine, and now you don't know which stage belongs to what section of your SQL code. We want to enable you to be kind of follow the cookie crumbs to saying, okay, this section of your code is connects to this stage in, the, uh, in your application, and what is it doing in there? What data frames is it operating on? Um, and that's about the end of my talk. Please visit us. Our booth is uh, 407. It's right up front. And um, before you guys leave, my colleague back there has a set of tokens. If anybody takes a token and go to our booth, a free T-shirt for you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Vinod. Um, we have a couple minutes for questions, so if the people who are leaving could just stay a bit quieter and then uh, we could have a couple questions. So uh, just raise your hand and I'll bring you the microphone. Uh, so today when you move to a different uh, inspection point, does the program need to rerun from the start? Yes. Okay. And today it does. Thanks. So you're going to be doing SQL support, but in the meantime, if I'm using data frames and data sets, uh, I can still inspect yeah. my RDDs. I just yeah. don't necessarily know where they came from, right? Exactly. So essentially, what we are going to do with uh, data frames is give you that level of abstraction so that you can, if, a SQL, if, you, are in, if you know data frames, you don't want to be dealing with RDDs. We're just going to make it better, a better user experience. Um, are there any plans for Python support, or is this always going to be Scala only? Today, Scala, definitely, we are looking at Python. It's, a, it's an earlier beast to uh, tackle. But yes, data science is uh, almost synonymous with Python. So yes, we are definitely considering it. Regarding SQL, so Spark SQL, when it runs, it generates a bunch of temporary RDDs that you won't be able to aren't necessarily specifically in the SQL. So will you be able to inspect each one of those? Yes. This, this, you can inspect any, any RDD arbitrarily. Uh, there's no limitation to that. So if the RDDs are generated like partially within a task, you have that level of visibility yes. even on cluster? Yes. Uh, what is the resource usage to run this application? Does it run on the same cluster? Or? It'll run on your cluster. It's part of the driver. So my, right now, the, the problem you're solving is a failing app or a problem app. So I'm assuming performance is not the top level concern. We have tools to help you with performance. This is primarily around debugging. So it's not additional. It'll, so whatever, let's say you're inspecting a, an RDD, it's going to run the code up to that RDD. So whatever was done, whatever resources was consumed by your application in the first round, it'll use that much resources again, I imagine. Okay. <coughs> so does this require the whole package to be installed or is it just a pure jar that you add to your Spark just distribution? Just a pure, it's not, there's no, you basically, right. it is installed as part of our uh, RPM that is general or general purpose RPM that gets installed on each node in your software, you know, of your cluster to provide performance management. We have not yet decided whether we want to sell this as a separate package or not. Okay. 
Have you tested it with streaming and structured streaming? No, that's next. Okay. And you can run this from like AWS or yeah. from local, it doesn't Yeah, care. there's no, no restriction over there. Wherever you run your Spark code, you can run this. Okay. Uh, just to clarify, um, at the beginning you said uh, we, we hold all the RDDs after the program runs? Metadata, not the RDD. Okay, okay. So every time you want to check something, have to be rerun? Yes, at this time, yes. We are looking at how do you make it so it is not so, uh, like the next steps in our, our journey is you can attach to a streaming app. You cannot re restart a steam streaming app. Right. So how do you attach to a, a exactly, running app? Yeah. So that's, that's our next step in this journey. We're okay. working on that right now. Thank you. Excellent, and if there are no more questions, let's give Vinod one more round of applause. Thank, Thank you. you.